Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to episode three of Technology and the Law with me, your host, Frank Jennings, the Cloud Lawyer. Uh, on today's panel, we've got Chris Cooper from Know Now, uh, Avril Chester from Scope, and Martin Warren from NetApp. This is the uh, hot topic of the day. You didn't think data protection could be interesting, and maybe after this you'll, you probably um, won't have changed your mind, but um, I, it's certainly the, the hot topic of the day, and lots of people are asking me questions about it. So we're going to talk about the general data protection regulation. What, what does it mean, and what's it all about? Um, so, Avril, can I turn to you first? What does GDPR mean to you? Oh, what GDPR means to me as a citizen is that actually I start to get hold of the privacy of my data. I start owning it and actually from a business standpoint, you know, you can't do things with my data that I don't authorise. If I put my business hat on, actually it's a different viewpoint. I now need to be very, very careful and even more careful with the data I hold, how I process it and making sure I've got the relevant consent. Uh, Martin, does, does GDPR matter? Yeah, absolutely matters. Uh, it affects every company that processes data on behalf of EU citizens. I think that uh, from a personal point of view, again, it's, uh, it's got real benefits. It also, I think, will change the way that companies manage their data. Yeah. So for years, data has often been managed in a rather kind of slipshod fashion, and I think it will tighten that, and it will make people store the data that they really need to store rather than the things they don't need to store. Is that what you're seeing then, Chris, um, that, that, that it's going to affect everybody and uh, up until now has been a bit of a slip shot approach to data protection? Oh, absolutely. Um, GDPR is an awesome bit of legislation an for awesome us. Awesome bit of legislation. You heard it here first. <laughs> uh, for us as citizens and because what it does is it gives us control and it allows us as punters, as consumers to decide how we want to share that information. From a company's perspective, those supplying those services and experience, Again, this is, I use the word again, awesome opportunity, because it means that they can target the exact services and things that people want to receive because they said that they want to do it. And that's going to build up trust, and trust leads to better customer SAP, better bottom line. Yeah. I can only see it as being a good thing, and let's, let's crack on and stop complaining. Fair enough. So, um, so GDPR, then, is an awesome piece of legislation which will uh, empower citizens. So I think we can probably agree on that side of things, certainly from a... From a citizens or data subject as the as the legislation says mm -hmm. it's a great opportunity for you to be able to control how your data is managed by third party suppliers but um, what i want to do is is talk today a bit more about how uh, gdpr will affect uh, those companies who handle the data so we all mm -hmm. we, we take it as read that it's great for for the individual but now we need to work out how that's going to um, affect supplies in, in the industry. Um, it becomes enforceable on the 25th of May uh, 2018. Um, I've read some interesting surveys recently where uh, some people have ha only 10, uh, 10 out of every 30 companies, uh, so 33% have, have started making preparations for GDPR. Uh, one I read a couple of months ago, which I thought was um, really quite insightful, is that uh, people have abandoned GDPR preparations, which, which is quite remarkable. So they've heard about it and they've already abandoned it on the basis that Brexit will cancel it. Um, mm -hmm. let's, let's cut straight to the chase. Uh, the EU data protection regulation is a piece of uh, um, regulation, it's a red tape, if you like, from the European Union, but Brexit won't kill it. Um, it will come into force next May, so at least a year before we do a Brexit. Mm -hmm. It will become in enforceable. All the documents that I've read from the current government suggest that data, the free flow of data is, is absolutely crucial to our economy, mm -hmm. and that will, that will have to continue beyond Brexit. So let's, let's cut that one straight out now. Mm -hmm. You can check out at any time you like, but you can never leave, um, and that's the, that's mm -hmm. the case for uh, data protection. Um, so on, on the basis then that Brexit won't cancel GDPR, um, what kind of preparations are you taking, Avril? So we have a program in scope that uh, we've already put underway. And uh, basically, uh, effectively what we've done is uh, looked at the gaps. You know, there's always, as you said, opportunities to get better. So what are the gaps we have against the legislation? Let's then put that into sensible group work streams and then yeah. let's deliver against that. So we're already on the work stream stage. We're already in the delivery stage. And uh, yeah, I'm very pleased with the way it's going. And is that your general impression of, of businesses out there. We've talked about the, those businesses who are aware of GDPR and have already cancelled because of mm -hmm. Brexit and, and um, the, the more recent survey which suggested only 33% of businesses have actually started taking steps. Is that your experience as well? Yeah, we actually ran a, a survey uh, over 750 
and uh, customers across the UK, Germany and France and uh, the findings in some areas were quite interesting and alarming in, in the sense that the 9% uh, across those, those three countries said that they weren't even aware what GDPR was. Yeah. So that's it. That's and also 51% believed that the, um, the responsibility was down to the uh, processor rather than the actual controller. Okay, we're starting to use um, data jargon now. We, we should probably explain for the, for the um, <coughs> in a 30-second uh, snapshot of what the data controller is, is effectively the person who collects the data and decides um, the, the purposes of which that data is going to be used. So they control the, um, the uses of the data. The processor then will act on behalf of the controller and in, in, in our kind of situation, it might be a cloud provider or a technology provider or an infrastructure provider who will provide the mechanism for the controller to, to process that, that data. So, so you've, you've got the, the, um, the age-old problem of if you sign up on standard terms as, as a data controller customer, if you're starting, signing up on a standard terms, does that make the process the controller because they're using their standard terms, they're effectively dictating the, the terms to you? We won't focus too long on that for now, safe to say that um, the controller is still the controller and the processor is still the mm -hmm. processor. It doesn't matter where the balance mm -hmm. of, of, of power is mm -hmm. in terms of agreeing the, the contract. What GDPR will do though is, is make some actions uh, responsibilities on the processor and yeah. make it enforceable for the first time yeah. against the processor. Yeah. Um, so Chris, uh, would you agree with Martin that there's generally poor awareness or there's, there's good awareness of, of GDPR and the people that you're talking to? How far advanced are they? So I think it really depends on what type of business you are. If you've got yeah. competent security professionals, they would have been aware of GDPR and looking at it from a security compliance perspective. Larger organisations seem to be well on the path of delivering their privacy impact assessments and getting their house in order and understanding the scale of the challenge they have to deal with. I think the new one, uh, talking to cloud providers, is this dual responsibility. The, the penny's just kind of dropped in the last month, I would say, in terms of the volume of oh, yikes moments that are go going on out there. Local authorities who we've been dealing with, um, Socketim recently did a bit of a study and out of 400 plus uh, local authorities, only around 70 were actively working on a plan with the rest going, hmm, I need to do something about it. Come the new financial year though, we're seeing a lot more advanced planning being done by local authorities. So expect that bow wave of DPO need to be hitting us when those guys start coming back from the summer holidays going, right, we've got four months, we need to do something. And then there are sceptics out there who say that the uh, first time in which a lot of people will probably take preparation for um, GDPR readiness is in May next year when, when some of the fines come, come into force. Let's talk about the fines yes. because if anybody's heard about GDPR, they've probably heard it in the context of the fines. Um, the fines are, are for the most, most egregious breaches, so, so the worst possible breach could be up to 4% uh, of global turnover or 20 million euros, whichever is larger. So yes. um, I gave in um, the in the first episode when we were talking about uh, GDPR and data location, I gave the example that the largest ever fine in the UK against TalkTalk, Talk, which was £400,000, 80% mm, yeah. of the maximum at the time, could translate into about £56, £57 million mm -hmm. were that to be recalculated yeah, under yeah. GDPR. Are people concerned about fines, Chris? Um, do you know, it's really interesting. I think your point earlier about they're waiting for the first fine to be levied. I think there's a lot of organisations that don't consider themselves to need to be covered by GDPR. What's interesting, I look at transport organisations in particular, they've never had a personal relationship with their customer, but because of ITSO, so those, those cards, the Oyster card, all of a sudden yeah. you've got personal data. You're tagging location, the entity of you, I understand your origin destination, that's a very rich personal data profile. Where's the GDPR offering from TfL? Yeah. What are the, the tour operators, those kind of guys doing? I think they're, they're the, the laggards in our industry, whereas others such as your healthcare providers, local authorities, are now starting to get on the front foot, so to speak. So different industries, different beats to getting to their GDPR readiness. As we know, the Information Commissioner is not shy when it comes to finding uh, public sector and mm -hmm. charitable organisations. Um, so this is something the scope is clearly taken very seriously. Absolutely, and I think the whole of the charity sector is, you know, absolutely, we can do things much better than we have done in the past, which is why we're having a look at the gaps and what we actually need to achieve. Yeah. 
Okay, and um, it's it's not just the fines though, and, it, and and everybody makes um, big head big headlines about the fines, and probably rightly so, because a four percent of global turnover fine is is pretty severe. Um, but I think it's worth running through the the other power the powers that the uh, regulatory the supervisory authorities have, which are often overlooked because of the um, the, the large nature of the fine. So. Um, my view is that the Information Commission is fairly pragmatic and um, she could have issued fines which are higher than 400,000. She could have gone for the max, 500,000 pounds, but she didn't. Mm. So, um, uh, and, and the dealings that I've, I've um, had with, with the Information Commissioner generally and, and the, some of the rulings have been fairly pragmatic is when you are wrong um, and then you will, you will be reprimanded. So let's have a look at those. There, there are various other powers that the Commissioner has, including to issue a warning against uh, 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 potential data breaches reprimand the data controller, um, order to comply with the data subject's request in re response to, to protecting their rights. You can order to comply with the regulations in a specified manner in a specified period. So as you can see, these are starting to get more and more onerous as, mm -hmm. as they go down. Mm -hmm. You can require a communication of, the, of a breach to the data subject, so you're, you're in breach, whereas previously you might, might have been able to get away with it. Um, now you not only have to notify the, the information commissioner within, uh, without undue delay and in any respect within 72 hours, mm -hmm. so there's something new under the GDPR, mm -hmm. but she might also force you to let the data subject know that this mm -hmm. has happened. She might prevent you from or ban you from processing uh, data further. She might require rectification or, or erasure of data or restrict your ability to, to process. Mm -hmm. She might withdraw any sort of kind of certification that you've been able to um, uh, obtain under the regulation. She might in, uh, um, impose a fine in addition to all of these things, or she might even prevent you from suspending data flows. Um, what do you make of that, Martin? Well, I mean, it's, it's obviously very disruptive to your business. And our view is that if you can provide defensible evidence, if you can provide something that clearly shows that you've done the right thing, then you are going to be you know, no one really knows how how that's going to go, but I would imagine it's going to. It means that you're going to be treated more favourably than those companies that just have done nothing or have not not taken the, the act seriously. So that's really what we're working on. We're working on a holistic solution that starts with laws, law firms, and ends with us as data management and uh, you know a data company actually looking after the ongoing. Uh, storing of that, that data and management of that data because it doesn't just end at the 25th you know this is ongoing this yeah. companies will need to maintain this for forever yeah. uh, and I think it's going to really change the way that, that companies operate mm. we as a company um, are actually you know we are leading by example in the sense that um, many years ago we decided not to go down the safe harbor route so for an American company transferring data between Europe and, and the US we went for the much more stringent uh, binding corporate rules route and we're one of less than 100 companies that have got that so we feel that we're very well uh, positioned to have those yeah. conversations we we think we're about 95 percent ready for gdpr wow 95 percent so, ready that's um... so we we feel that we're in a very very strong position and our suppliers are also required to adhere to those privacy um, you know that privacy first approach by uh, we put in place um, you know model contractual causes uh, to, so that they they uh, they adhere to to our rules and so that we're, we're all our suppliers are also uh, linking in with that as well. So from a, from your point of view, mm -hmm. um, Avril, uh, building data protection into your systems by design and default uh, is not a is not a quick measure. I take the point that Martin says he's ninety five percent ready. I, I would I would imagine that most businesses out there, even if they've heard of GDPR and even if they've started taking preparations, are probably not ninety five percent. Ready. Uh, there might be some changes to the consent uh, obtained from data subjects, so the mandatory breach notification, which I which I mentioned earlier. And there's this question of whether you need to appoint a data protection officer. So, so your program will be tackling all of these issues. You, um, I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you how ready you are. You're probably not 95% ready, but certainly these are things that you're working through. Absolutely, and I think there's a really good piece about the data protection officer. Um, to state the obvious, it's data protection officer and I think if I may slightly generalize in organizations it's become a little bit more apparent that data is or you know the responsibility of technologies because it's data yeah. Yeah. well absolutely we have a responsibility for the way we hold it for the way we transfer it for the way mm -hmm. it's um, securely kept 
But from an individual perspective, every single person in that organization has a responsibility for how they're using that data, what they're using that data for, and when they're going to be using that data. So from a data protection officer perspective, let me sort of come back. Typically, you'll find those in an IT department. Really, now it's the time to challenge that. You know, data is you know, the, the weakest link is just one individual yeah. sending sort of one piece of paper or not on the train. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to make sure that moves to a more centralized place. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, we're not unique in that situation. It needs to be a centralized place and actually needs to be owned. And they need to have a direct contact uh, to a member of the board, so for example, mm -hmm. so they can do easy, easy whistleblowing. Mm -hmm. It needs to be out of operations. They need yeah. to be able to healthily challenge IT and the rest of the organization. Mm -hmm. it's, worth, um, it's worth picking up on a couple of points that you made there, Avril. Um, that um, this isn't about all data, this is just about personally identifiable mm -hmm. information as, mm -hmm. the, as, as it's known in the sector. Personal mm -hmm. data, not necessarily all of your data. So if you're able to segregate your data as part of your GDPR preparation to say, well, this is actually not PII, personally identifiable mm -hmm. information, this is not personal data, I don't need to worry about that to the GDPR standard. From an organization, you probably still want to keep it secure, mm -hmm. um, but you don't necessarily have to treat it in the same manner in which you mm -hmm. would treat your um, personal data over here. The, the other thing that's worth um, mentioning from your comment a minute ago is that we're talking about data protection officers and I know that Germany is very keen to have yeah. DPOs rolled out. Um, yeah. Any organization I think with more than 10 employees needs to have a data mm -hmm. protection officer. Um, we're not expecting that to be rolled, um, we're not expecting that kind of gold plating in the UK where mm -hmm. it's, it's um, we're probably going to stick to the to the regulation which is that if, if there's a large scale of data processing then you're probably going to need to have uh, data protection officer. So not everybody will need to have a data protection officer. I think it's probably worth yeah. making that point. I mean, we work in all those countries, so we have to, you know, we, we are very large in Germany. Our biggest yeah. operation is in Germany, yeah. so yeah. we will obviously adhere there, and that's where our BCRs yeah. Are, uh, Finally, uh, from, yeah, from yeah, Germany. Yeah. It's a bit of, obviously, if, if you've got a, a number of different um, branch offices or you trade in a number of different countries, then it, then it would probably make sense to adhere to the minimum requirements. That's what and, we do. Yeah. And it looks like the, Germany, uh, the German gold plating is going to lift it slightly above mm -hmm. uh, German data protection mm -hmm. regulations. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes sense to, to yeah. adhere to that standard. Yeah. But um, even if you don't need to appoint a data protection officer, my <coughs> advice would be to appoint somebody with overall responsibility for yeah. making sure that you're GDPR compliant. Um, and to take your point from earlier, Martin, it's better that, you've, that you can show that you've done something mm -hmm rather than having done nothing, because then hopefully that will help you avoid the fines and, and all the powers mm -hmm. that the Information Commissioner mm -hmm. Office ha has. Um, data portability is, is one of the, the, the new rights. Which, uh, do you see much of um, interest in that, Chris, from your point of view? No, not yet. Well, and I think one of the key things is that we, we're going to go on a journey with this GDPR exercise, which is understanding where my data is. Yeah. And the first person that says, I need to port my data from this service provider to this service yeah. provider in a seamless fashion. And for that to occur with also a right to be forgotten probably with that other organization. So stop marketing to me, I'm not your customer anymore. Um, how does that happen? And you know, there's, I think there's different ways and techniques. Use of standards, I'd always strongly adhere to. So you are calling a name a name, a person a person. It's not anything unambiguous. Um, and, in, and using industry methods of, of data transport, so it's secure, it's encrypted. Yeah. Um, sometimes that may be non-technological if it's hefty amounts of data. It could be an armoured car with a, with a floppy disk. You know, we don't necessarily have to fall back on some, some standard ways. It sounds like um, what we covered uh, in last week's episode. So if you haven't seen episode two, do there's, check it out. There's, um, there's a lot of, where Neil's talking about well, um, the, the methods in which you would migrate data. And, and some providers might use this as an opportunity to make additional money out of an outgoing customer. But GDPR would suggest that certainly in respect of personal data, yeah. it's got to be made available to the to the, maybe the data subject um, in a uh, industry standard. We'll, we'll see what what that will give yeah. rise to, and wh whether controllers must give empower the data subjects. And as a result of empowering data subjects yeah. with their right to data portability, that will filter th across the board. So one of the pieces of work that we're doing at No Now is getting involved in something called the Kantara Initiative, which is creating a standard for consent. And part of that standard is the ability to have interoperability between okay. systems on being able to read your consent receipt. Or a consent receipt is a statement of consent for that particular provider. Mm -hmm. I promise to give my data to this provider for these aims and I'll get this service in return. And that's just a statement in time. That portability is really important. Um, yeah. So you've got to be able to have that. And Kantara working with EMA as well and the EU 
from a citizen-centric perspective on ensuring that different systems can read your different consents from irrespective. Because yeah. you as a citizen don't care where you've posted. You just want to say, look, that's yeah. what I've got there and that's what I've got there. So consent was you one of the it. issues that came up in the charitable <laughs> sector recently where the Information Commission issued a number of fines against uh, um, charities for reusing information where there wasn't the appropriate level of, of consent. So Scope obviously will we'll be looking at that in... in a, you weren't one of the charities that was fine recently. No, we won't. So, um, so one, one hopes then that um, the consent won't be a massive leap for, 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 um, for scope or, or um, generally changing to, to levels of consent. It's got to be clear and explicit. That's certainly yeah. the way it seems to be interpreted. That yeah. if I, as, as a recipient or a, a, a data subject, want to have my data used in a particular manner, mm -hmm. um, you as a charity or you as, a, as, a, as yeah. a provider will say, well, this is how we're going to use your data. Click accept or yeah. tick a box or, or whatever yeah. it is. So I think the regulation is, is aimed at trying to clarify that quagmire, if, yeah. if you like, of, of um, confusion, where if you get um, somebody's information, you don't know why it was obtained and what purposes it was for, and can yeah. I use it for other purposes after that? Yeah. Um, GDPR will, will hopefully track that through, that you've mm. got to have a, a much cleaner pair of shoes, if you like, when yes. it comes to processing yes. data. Absolutely. And if yeah. I may, I'd like to offer a couple of pieces of advice for other charities, because um, we, we tend to automatically think about fundraising. So we focus yeah. there first. Yeah. And actually, mm. as you know, it's across the piece. It, you know, it's also about who's on the Christmas card list, you yeah. know, on the yeah. chief executive office uh, you know, laptop. So, you know, it really needs to be across the organisation. Mm. Um, and then uh, secondly, it's a case of um, don't run out and start looking about how you're going to get consent first. Remember to sort of do a bit of analysis. Mm. What are you going to process the data for? Yes. Why do you need yes. it? Mm. Once you've done that, yes. then you can look back so you can make sure you can yeah. obtain the yes. right specific consent. So try not to do it a bit back to front. So there's, there's, um, there's, there's two levels there. One is where you're um, taking information and deliberately using it in, in a manner which you may know is, is not... Um, subject to the appropriate levels of consent, but but the other, as you as you point out, might simply be um, in your rush to, to use the information and yeah. ideally provide a mm -hmm. great service to the to the data um, subject. You might not realise that the level of consent that you got from them doesn't cover all the extra mm -hmm. marketing or, or other activities that, that you've got planned. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's pick up. I, I want to move on to um, a subject of international transfers. You've yes. got binding corporate rules yes. because you found that that was a better mechanism than safe harbour, which as it turns out, it's, it's probably justified, isn't it? We, yeah, we were very fortunate in that our uh, chief global data protection officer, um, privacy officer, is originally from Ireland, based in the US. So she saw things from a European point of view as well as a US point of view. And at the time, um, it probably wasn't the most popular move to force that on a company that at the time didn't need to do that. Uh, but it's really, really paid off for us because uh, the safe harbour, as you know, you know, was deemed to be illegal by the uh, Court of Justice a couple of years ago. And we were in that position where, you know, we weren't using safe harbour. There's about 5,000 other international companies that use safe harbour or privacy shield, which is its replacement. You mentioned that uh, in Germany and other countries they will probably challenge all of those, those uh, you know, privacy shield and, yeah. and also add other levels of, um, you know, enforcement on top of GDPR. So it will, it will be, you know, GDPR plus, if you like. Um, but if, if I may, can I just, just quickly go back to the data portability thing? Because that, that really is something that, like, we as a company absolutely, that's, that's, our, that's our lifeblood. Um, we move data from one place to the other, so basically what we do is we link with a common format all the data between different service providers. So you can put your data into AWS or into Azure, but you can also then get it back again mm -hmm. in a format that's common yeah. so that you can actually bring it to another service provider or back on-prem. So I think that's, that's going to be very important as we, as we go forward. And it allows companies to actually change their direction. Should other legislations come along, they can also then adapt to that. Maybe their business changes and they decide that they want to put more in the cloud and you know, less on-prem or, or the other way around. So, so that, you know, that's data really portability and, and internationals standardisation of um, data formats, I think, mm -hmm. will, will probably continue to grow. And, I, and that's, I think so. Uh, GDPR will, will, in some extent help that. I, I want to go back to international transfers. Uh, the safe harbour was annulled um, a couple of years ago, as you point out, because um, the, the idea was that, uh, that you'd be able to transfer data to, to the US and that it would be uh, uh, um, 
kept and processed in accordance with the rigorous standards of the um, European Data Protection Directive as it was, uh, as, as it currently is, in advance of the regulation. But what they found out, of course, was that the National Security Agency in, in the States did actually have as, uh, broad powers as, as, um, as we're all led to believe in the James Bond mm -hmm. films. Um, and they, they were sharing it with G GCHQ and, and uh, it, was, it seemed to, to some extent to be a bit of a free-for-all for, um, for data management. So Safe Harbor was annulled and we've now got Privacy Shield. And as you point out, it, Privacy Shield is going through some challenges as well. So we mm. wait to see what's, what's going to happen at, at the back end of that. Is, is that something that you're focusing on, Chris? Um, do you know what's really strange is with our um, consent management solution, um, which is being picked up from a GDPR perspective, fixing one part of the GDP, GDPR puzzle and consent, we've got more interest or as much interest from North America and US organizations working outside of their government regulation and for their own home market. Mm. Because of the broad global coverage that GDPR gets, they cannot guarantee that they don't have an EU citizen sitting in their systems. Yeah. So they often start with the premise that, well, all our EU source data, which typically tends to be in the UK because of the ease of setting up a European operation in the UK, this equivalency and going back to your Brexit comment, it's a done deal. It's, yeah. it's going to happen because yeah. you're going to do one set of investment. And they're quite excited about, from a US perspective, of having a divergence. And one of the things the smart marketeers have got their head around is that they can have a more honest conversation. So if you can, and of course with American, having worked in an American organization before, has a very broad and go get it kind of attitude. It's, well, we've got a deadline, we've got some challenges, we've got a team, we've got to come together, and we've got an opportunity to make a bit of profit as well. So let me be it's clear that GDPR good. won't prevent um, international transfers. It's one of those myths that um, constantly does the rounds that you have to keep German data inside of Germany and you yeah. have to keep yeah. English data it's inside of England. It's but, it, but, it's, but it's a nonsense. And I, I, I echo what you say, Chris. So the, the US um, clients that I've been speaking to, and perhaps, again, I'm, I'm getting to see a particular um, uh, niche of, of US businesses, by the time they've come to me, they're aware that GDPR is an issue mm -hmm. and they're already making preparations for it. But certainly the ones I've been speaking to are taking this seriously. So far from Brexit being the means by which a piece of useless EU legislation or red tape is killed off, mm. um, actually what's going to happen, I think, is that GDPR is going to see an export of EU data protection standards, not just into the Brexiting mm. Britain, <clears throat> but throughout, throughout the globe. And again, because yeah. of our global work that we're doing with Kantara, which is looking at consent standards, which will hopefully be taken up by the I, I, ISO um, from an international standards perspective, they're saying GDPR is the benchmark. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone is flowing through, to, and this includes Southeast Asia, Australia, yeah. New Zealand, Canada. Yeah. The US may be the last to fall, but the standard's there and we should embrace it. What well, I've been speaking to compliance officers, that, um, and this is probably um, your um, uh, perception too, Avril, is mm -hmm. that um, if you've got a, an EU standard up here, you could possibly get away with a, a UK standard down here if, if for whatever reason um, the UK government decides to a adopt a lower standard of data because this data is, is not governed by EU yeah. um, GDPR, therefore we can have a lower standard. Uh, I, I don't see any appetite for, from that for any of the people I've been speaking to mm -hmm. about data protection. It's, it's if, if, it's, if I have to comply with this standard for yeah. EU data, then I may as well apply that standard across the yeah. board. Is that, is that your yeah. sense as well? Absolutely correct. And it goes back to what we were saying earlier. Actually, as citizens, you know, you'd then go back and say, well, why aren't you taking the privacy of my data seriously? Yes. yes. Why would yeah. I then want to deal with you? Why would yeah. I then want to donate with you? And, and I think that's a really good point, that it's not all about sticks. There is benefit out of this. You know, mm. organisations that can clearly demonstrate that they are in good shape are going to be the ones that you want to do business with. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, they, they can turn and also they, from a data point of view, they're going to be able to manage that data and, and mobilize that data a lot more effectively than those companies that have not, you know, taken it on wholeheartedly. So I think there's a real opportunity here. Well, as we said to our customer, we've reduced your data cost by 20% and increased your data effectiveness by 50%. Exactly. All for a one time hit of yeah. getting your act in order, yeah. which was partly us and partly them as a data controller yeah. and we're the data processor. And part of the um, GDPR preparations, Avril, again, is, is going to be uh, presumably, it's, we, we talked about um, it, it's the person who sends the email to the, to, the, mm -hmm. um, to the wrong place and it contains sensitive information. We've seen various 
different instances where the Information Commissioner has taken a dim view of that kind of approach or, or where the data has been taken out on a, on a mobile device or uh, unencrypted and, and it's contained sensitive mm -hmm. data. Um, <clears throat> it's about people, process and technology, isn't yeah. it? It's, you can't just implement new, new systems. So for all those GDPR experts who've suddenly sprung up overnight waving this GDPR magic wand will fix everything for you. Yeah. You, you, can't, <clears throat> you can't just wave a, a wand and fix everything when you've got to build in data protection by design and default. And you, you've got people who might not necessarily know what their obligations are unless you've trained them and, and so on and so forth. Exactly. You can't buy yourself into, <clears throat> into GDPR compliance. I mean, no. you know, and it doesn't start with technology. No. And, you know, I come from a technology company and that's kind of a, a different view. But uh, it starts with the legal piece. And then, you know, look at the technologies that you can put in place mm. that help you manage it. Mm. Look at all the pieces that you need. Uh, and, and look at it as a whole thing rather than so just training staff thing. is probably right at the top Training's of the list. Training's huge and you know scope are not unique. Yeah. You know, let's say, you know, I personally think it's the biggest challenge. Yeah, it's not necessarily about the approach, you know, to do e learning or go out or whatever. Actually you've got, you know, various people across the organization, including volunteers. Mm -hmm. Not only do they need to understand what you're telling them, they mm. then need to change yes. their behaviour. Yes. Yeah, and that's yeah. why training is so important. Yeah, and the other opportunity here, of course, is not to make sure just that, uh, that the, the staff are up to date and the technology is up to date, but that you've got internal processes, you've got a data protection yes. management yes. policy yes. in place so that, that you can point, again, even if it's um, just to make sure that you can say to the Information Commissioner, we have taken some steps and, mm. and for whatever reason this form fell through the gap, maybe mm. that will result in a rap on the knuckles rather than a, a hefty yeah. fine, but, yeah. but certainly it helps um, show that you've made some preparations. Uh, and of course... As customer supplier contracts, as a contracts lawyer, I'm bound to say that. But it's a, it's a neat way for you to try to establish the the goalposts with your customer or your yes. supplier, depending yes. on which side of the fence you yes. are. But GDPR is is coming into effect. Yeah. It's it's um it's going to be serious. The fallout from it could be could be quite damaging to our business. We are engaging you to look after this particular aspect of our data, mm. um, or as a as a, an individual, um, I want you to look after my data and, and give me some services, but make sure it's protected. Mm -hmm. So not just keep it secure, but make mm. sure you use it for the for the correct um, means, mm -hmm. um, the correct purposes, and I can pass that down through through contract. Maybe not as an individual, but certainly mm. as a data controller, mm. you should yeah. be looking at your processes yeah. to say, well, you have to follow our instructions, otherwise we, the controller, get into trouble. Yes. And that's a neat way for a controller to, to pass on some of the responsibility because under the GDPR, processes will become Equal. responsible yeah. to, to yeah. some extent. Yeah. They, they're directly enforceable against them. They've got yeah. to keep um, logs of records or, or processing and if they don't follow the uh, controller's instructions, then the information commission could, could find them um, direct. Um, so, so people are starting to say, well, does that mean that we should, we should get insurance for, to cover data breaches? Um, my, my view is that if you're asking, if the answer is insurance, the question is, is wrong because it's already happened. It's you're a sticking to, plaster, isn't it? It's you trying know. to prevent something yeah. after it's already happened, which, yeah. is, which, which is a bit late. What's your sense for insurance in the industry, Chris? I think it would be done by people that aren't confident that they've got the right processes in place. I think the key word you used was people and process. Mm. Technology brings those two together. Mm. Yeah. And a comment was made earlier that you've got to make your GDPR compliance embedded in your organization end to end. It's not just a security thing. Yes, it's a marketing yeah. thing. It's a customer contact thing. Yeah. Yes. It's wherever you've got that personally identifiable information in your organization, yeah. justify it keep it under lock and key and make sure you've got a robust set of processes that are constantly checked mm. and validated. Yeah, I mean, it's the HR department that keeps a CV beyond the point yep. where they've not mm. taken that person on. Why are they holding the CV? Yeah. You know, and it's it, easy target. And, it, and, it's, and it's and actually a waste of money because it's exactly. dead data sitting on a disk. And you're backing it up years and years. And yeah. you don't need to do And insurance it. has numerous exceptions. And at the moment, we're seeing this um, transition phase where s some policies will, will um, refer to data breaches or mm. data security issues, but not necessarily data protection fines. So mm. um, if, if insurance is your answer, then you, I think you need to go out and check the policy wording quite closely. Yeah. Um, so so in, um, in an attempt to wrap up then, which is uh, this massive topic, which we've not really done justice to in, in 30 minutes, but I, well, I'm very grateful for your contributions. Um, Chris thinks it's um, an awesome piece of legislation. <laughs> Avril thinks yeah. that from a, from a citizen point of view, this, this is absolutely the right time for it. Um, and Martin's saying, from a provider's point of view, um, he, he's uh, very close to being GDPR ready. Or, um, but, but even if you've done um, something, it's going to be better 
than nothing when it comes to um, mm -hmm. sitting before the information commissioner. So um, what, what would, should you take away as a result of um, t today's discussion? Well, uh, there are a number of things that you can do if you haven't already. Um, Brexit won't kill GDPR. Let's be absolutely clear on that. It's not a tick box exercise. Um, what I think you need to do is identify what personal data you already have, what you use and what you're uh, proposing to use. You need to restrict the data to just that data that you really need. Uh, do you need lots of data for lots of things? Um, uh, the point earlier that you might have lots of information which you don't really need anymore and that could create a liability because there is no grandfathering on the 25th of May next year. It comes into, becomes enforceable and then you have to uh, make sure that everything's already covered even if it ha happened before the 25th of May. Um, you need to build data protection in by design and defaults. You need to consider privacy impact in, um, assessments if, if there's likely to be a high risk of, uh, of um, data subject uh, rights being affected. Um, think about your customer and supplier contracts, of course. Uh, again, I would say that. You don't necessarily need to appoint a data protection officer, but you do need to appoint somebody to, to monitor compliance and make sure that that's uh, adhered to on an ongoing basis. And that's all we've got time for. I'd like to thank my panel, Chris Cooper from Know Now, Avril Chester from Scope, Martin Warren from NetApp. I've been your host, Frank Jennings, the Cloud Lawyer. Join us next week when we'll be talking about social media issues. Thank you very much. <laughs>